Okay, thanks for joining today. Uh, we're going to take you over uh, a product which we call PhoneFX, which is primarily aimed for help desk scenarios. It's a single phone control solution, um, which is a little bit ironic because when we entered the kind of remotely controlling phone space, we started with bulk control, you know, working with your entire estate at once, etc. But over the years, we did have a, a number of people say that, well, actually, I would like it to also just look like a phone as well. So this is something that we put together to solve that kind of requirement. Uh, it's been out for a little while now. Uh, we've got a couple of little updates that are part of this, but ultimately just a, a bit of a refresher to take you through it and, uh, you know, what, what it's there for and obviously allow you to ask some questions about it. So there's usual kind of format. Uh, so just take you through the house rules, a refresher on who we are uh, in terms of preferred solution partner. Then I'll take you through the design of um, of a single phone remote control solution, you know, good approaches and effectively the design criteria we use when we created this uh, phone FX solution. And then we'll talk about two of the key elements of phone FX, which from our perspective provide what we class as help desk nirvana, and that is a combination of remote control and editing or edit and compare specifically. So we'll kind of take you through some examples of that. Um, then we'll cover how to install it, you know, its requirements, the setup side of it. Um, then we'll talk about the fact that it's not an isolated thing. You can actually get it on its own if you want to now. That's something we didn't really do at day one, but that's now possible. You can take phone FX in isolation of PhoneView, uh, but it is also bundled with PhoneView Enterprise Edition as well. And as part of that, we've also designed the two products to work together. Uh, that should lead into a demo, um, give you a conclusion, a Q&A at the end. So the usual house rules is just, you know, make sure you submit your questions to all panellists. Mohammed's on the session as well with me today, so uh, he can respond to any questions that come up. And just remember to use the Q&A panel, that'd be great. Um, so Unified FX, a little update since if, if any of our regular visitors for these sessions. Um, we now have a great thing. We now have a triple play of products with a triple play of Cisco compatibility and even a, a patent uh, in the mix as well. So a few updates uh, over the last few months as well. So obviously we've got phone view as always. I don't have phone FX and notification FX broken out as separate top level products. We kind of see them as a, a kind of derivative of phone view effectively. Uh, almost like a suite of uh, capabilities. Uh, but So we kind of bundle that in there. Um, but PhoneView, yep, that's anybody that's not aware of it. That's our uh, endpoint management solution. It's used to manage literally millions of Cisco phones, uh, three odd million last time we checked. Um, we also have our Walward application, which we just recently put through Cisco compatibility testing and it I've got the rubber stamp and it's passed. Uh, I've actually got a webinar on that uh, in a week or two's time. So the dates at the end, just to confirm that, you may have registered for that already, but that will just give you an update on the latest version of Wallboard and just kind of reiterate the compatibility elements of it. Um, but the key thing about that Wallboard is it's currently designed for UCCX, which is to be fair, what most people have, uh, at least from a common market perspective. Um, but it's really simple to install and upgrade. It's 100% browser based and the way we've architected it, it's incredibly fast for real time updates. So it's all about simplicity and convenience. Um, migration effects actually follows that theme as well in terms of simplicity and convenience. Uh, that's something that we created on request of Cisco to make it really easy to replace old phones for new. Uh, we think that's actually something that's been starting to pick up a bit more lately because of the release of Communication Manager 12.5 um, and more people will be deploying to that version and therefore more people will have, uh, you know, more handset models that they've probably got that will now be depreciated. You know, some of the earlier 7900 series, for example, will no longer work with, uh, you know, 12 onwards. So as more people go to a mature version of 12.5, uh, there'll be more handsets that will need to get uh, replaced somehow. Um, I've maybe mentioned a couple of things with migration effects whilst I'm on the topic, because um, it's we do have a webinar on that one coming up. I think it's early January, but 
there's a couple of things we've been working on lately, which may not be quite ready for January, but they're, they're pretty close, uh, which is the ability to handle extensibility device profiles as part of a migration, and maybe even at some point, the ability to work with them separately to convert them from one model type to another. So that's something, again, that's come up over uh, the last little while, and uh, we've spent a bit of time on it, and we think we've got, a, well, we've got a prototype solution for it, so we just need to test all that out and add it in there. Uh, so we think that's going to be useful for those customers that use extensibility. They could obviously migrate right now, but you end up with a little bit of a disconnect because the logged in profiles uh, model wouldn't necessarily match the new handset. This solves that problem effectively. So some things moving in that space too. Uh, which I'll cover in more detail once we get to that migration effect session. Um, the other point is that technique of replacing the old phone for new, we've uh, we applied a, a little while back to get that patented because we thought that was innovative and unique, and thankfully it was agreed, and therefore we got issued the, the patent, so it's quite nice to have that rubber stamp on that. So in terms of the actual design of uh, a single phone remote control tool, there's a few key criteria that we really wanted to aim towards. We wanted it to look like a real phone. Right? That's probably the initial thing. There's a number of uh, other companies out there that have solutions um, for controlling phones. It's usually not their primary focus. It's definitely our primary focus. Um, it's usually not their primary focus. It's like an add-on because, you know, tr truth be told, the basic mechanics of controlling a phone are relatively simple, um, but doing it well and doing it at scale, doing it consistently and making the experience um, uh, positive uh, does take quite a lot of work, to be fair. Um, and part of making that experience convenient is making sure that as close as sensibly possible, it does resemble a, a full model layout. So that's one key criteria. And just nowadays, you know, everybody's using MacBooks and stuff like that, as much as they use PCs from an engineering point of view, just for that OS flexibility that you get, you know, we do, uh, never mind, you know, phones and tablets and things like that. Definitely a key focus is to be as platform independent as possible. Now, our software is still Windows based, as in the server side component of it, but, you know, we've fully adopted all the best practices from a web perspective. There to give us as much platform independence as we can. At some point where we can manage it, we'll make the server side platform independent as well. But to be fair, there's a fair amount of work involved in that. So that's just a incremental process. But at least from my client side perspective, it's completely platform independent is the target. Uh, you want to make it easy to find devices. So searching and filtering and things like that become important. Um, you want to make sure that you can jump straight to specific devices, you know, regular test phones you use, et cetera. And obviously you don't want to compromise in terms of the performance or scale of what you're working with. So when you think about that, we'll get model specific skins uh, is the solution to making it look like a phone. So we put a lot of effort into all these kind of web page skins, for lack of a better phrase, uh, to pretty closely match the physical buttons, appearance and positioning and things like that. It's never going to be absolutely exact. You know, the line buttons, we deliberately space them out a little bit. So if it's on a mobile device, a tablet, you don't end up pressing the wrong button accidentally. So um, there's some compromise that we have to make uh, for the different platforms. But, you know, it's worth it. But it's pretty damn close. Uh, then in terms of making it platform independent, as I touched on, you want it to be a web application. The important thing is there are zero plugins uh, and we use the latest XML5 capabilities, things like WebSockets, et cetera, to keep it real time. Uh, you want to make it easy to find devices. So as I touched on that, you want simple filtering and things like that, as I'll show you hopefully in the kind of admin interface for the PhoneFX software. Um, we'll put a lot of effort into that simplicity as well. So. That's a, a key criteria, so it's just very quick and simple to locate the device you want to work with. Uh, if you want to jump to specific devices, we have a, a we use an implement a technique which technically, in developer terms, is called deep linking. And what that means is, when you go to a particular URL, it should be able to sub navigate within a particular page, right? So it's not just going to a top level menu choice. It's like if you're in a particular section of a website and then you drill down into a particular sub page or two or three levels down, uh, the URL structure should be able to reflect that. So we've taken that on board um, 
as well. And the simplest level, and you'll see a little sample URL, you can just have simple URLs, you can bookmark and things like that, just to jump back to the same device. It means you can integrate with other applications as well, which I'll touch on a little bit too. Uh, there's no compromise in terms of performance and scale. And the way we do that is because this is the hard part, so to speak, is we use CTI uh, to control the phones. And we've got a particularly unique technique list. I don't think anybody's copied it yet and how we automate screenshots. Uh, companies that we've come across that have remote control tools usually have a timing mechanism where it's like every two or three seconds or one, you know, as fast as they can kind of or trying to force it to every second or something like that. But, but we come up with a technique which um, is the absolute optimal performance for every single phone model. Um, so it's as fast as the phone will give us the image, basically. Um, so the combination of those two things, CTI to control it for button presses means it's responsive and uh, efficient. And uh, screenshot automation um, and efficiency just works hand in hand to give you as real time an experience as you can sensibly manage. OK, so that's how we created Phone FX and, you know, like to think about it as being the ultimate single phone control solution, uh, you know, Bit of an arrogant statement, obviously, but it's something we'll work towards. If we've missed it, let us know where we've missed it and we'll fill that gap. Uh, in terms of uh, the solutions I've touched on, it's 100% web based. We're using the latest HTML5 teachers. Uh, obviously, you can access it from all the different platforms. We've uh, put a lot of effort into making the skins uh, responsive uh, in a sensible kind of manner. So it'll actually work all the way down to uh, a mobile phone interface and obviously all the way up to a PC display, uh, etc. So, you know, that's, it's not just one solution for one platform uh, as maybe other vendors have done at points in the past. Um, it's technically it's powered by Automation FX, the same platform that we use for Migration FX and basically anything that's web based, uh, we put on that platform. So that's designed to automate integration uh, with CUCM and uh, as a platform and we'll just keep building things on top of it over time. Uh, you can uh, integrate it with phone view. Uh, the way that works is within phone view when you right click on a phone uh, you've got some extra options. The only one I've actually listed on this bullet point is the right click choose the phone and then choose the control option. There's actually an edit option as well. Uh, so you can either control or edit the phone or both uh, too. Um, you can search and open from Automation FX. So basically you can work in hand in hand with phone view and the two work together and discover each other. Or else you can just work directly within the Automation FX interface. So it may be a little bit confusing, but I sometimes will interchange the word Automation FX and Phone FX. Uh, technically, Automation FX is providing the functionality and Phone FX is just a license effectively to unlock certain features on the platform that you know fit the Phone FX um, feature set. Um, so technically everything runs on Automation FX, so Phone FX is really just a marketing term in, in that respect, uh, which aligns to this single phone control functionality. Uh, it is bundled with PhoneView uh, 6 and above Enterprise Edition. Uh, and it's also available standalone uh, for purchase too, which will get details at the end. In terms of, uh, so that's the control aspect of it, but uh, an important thing that we kind of discovered when we went through this exercise of creating the phone FX uh, kind of functionality uh, was that actually it's ideal for help desk people. That's really the primary users of a single phone uh, control solution. Phone view with all the extra capabilities and bulk capabilities, etc., is more for you know level three help desk and uh, and you know system admins, engineers that just do um, you know the highest level kind of work on call manager for all the powerful testing that they may have to do and bulk changes. <clears throat> but um, when it comes to just looking at one phone at a time, that's more likely going to be a help desk person. Uh, so in that case, it's quite common that a help desk person would also be responsible for making simple edits uh, at the device or line level. You know, a user wants to change the speed dial and either you don't give them permission to, to do it themselves or, you know, maybe they've done it themselves and they've not done it correctly and you need to go in and um, change it for them and fix it, that kind of thing. There's also aspects where 
you know, you spin up a new phone for a particular location and things aren't set up properly, so it doesn't dial out the right gateway and all these things you have to kind of prove out, it doesn't get the right DDI number when it calls out and things like that. Um, so that's all about doing those simple edits. Now, I'll go over this more in the, the demo, but I do want to touch on it in this slide, is uh, what we've basically got is two main pages. There's a bit more to it than this, but the two main ones are device level edits. So you can see on the layout here, we have the button positions on the left hand side with all the different feature types uh, and it's linkable. So if you click the kind of blue extension number there, that then opens the page you're seeing on the right hand side and that goes into the detail of the, the line configuration, which you can then modify and save. Um, that also extends to the other button types, like you know, service URLs, speed dials, BLFs, etc. So they're all editable uh, within that buttons panel. Um, in terms of the device configuration, uh, we also have the ability to do a side by side comparison and even an automatic difference check. So uh, there's a little switch that you flick to go into compare mode. You choose the phone or phone template that you want to compare against. There may be a good phone for that site or a reference phone template uh, that you use for your configuration. And uh, once you shoot, turn that comparison on, you see field by field, uh, a comparison. And any that are different will have a little checkbox next to them because that allows you to copy that value over from the comparison device field by field. And there's also this difference button in the top right corner that uh, removes fields that are the same and only shows you differences. So by design, it's simple, effective, and you know quite powerful because of that comparison component. Uh, now, as I say, we focus not on allowing or providing full call manager administration through this, really just focus on the typical things that a help desk user would want to edit, which is, as far as we're aware, we be more device line level. Now, I'm sure the odd occasion might be other elements within CCM that a help desk user would uh, need to edit as well, and you know, have to take feedback on that. Maybe end user configuration would be something that we could add in the future, um, but for now, we'll focus on the device side of it. And here's the thing, uh, by having the combination of um, remote control, which is your ability to test that phone's configuration in one respect, and the ability to edit that device configuration and having them side by side in real time means that on the left hand side, I could perform an edit, you know, modify a line, a speed dial, something like that, save it. And on the right hand side, I'll see the phone quite literally refresh, come up with that updated configuration where relevant, and then it can be tested in place. Now, the reason for kind of calling it the inner loop is in kind of developer terms, when you're writing code, you modify your code, you compile and run to validate it, and then anything that's changed, needs change or incorrect, you go back, you edit your code, you run, compile, validate it, et cetera. And you keep that loop as tight as you can. And the smaller that inner loop, as you say, between modification and testing, uh, the more efficient and effective you can be. Because you know, if you've got a big program you're compiling and it takes 10 minutes to compile before you can test it, then one little change takes quite a long time to, to validate. And it's the same from a, you know, IP telephony management perspective. If you don't have a remote control capability, and you make an edit, you know, maybe your edit was good, maybe your edit wasn't, but you'd be dependent on the end user if they're available at that point in time or the next time they are available or call you back or something to give you that feedback um, before you'd be able to know if you did the right change and if you didn't, modify again. So that loop, could, that inner loop could be really large if you're dealing with an end user, if they're not available to you very quickly. Um, so this just eliminates the delay from the end user aspect and puts both things right in front of your desk. So that's why we class it Help Desk Nevada, because those two things put together. <clears throat> now, the way that we've designed everything in Automation FX uh, from the ground up, it's designed for integration, right? Now, we haven't really exposed even a fraction of the things that were built into the Automation FX platform externally yet. That's something we're 
hopefully going to manage uh, this year coming up, or as in 2019. I've uh, got a few plans to, to expose some of that. Um, but ultimately, because of how we're structured everything, it does make it really quick and easy to uh, integrate the functionality that we provide on automation effects with other systems. Uh, I've got a couple of examples of that. Now, the way that we achieve it, and specifically for phone effects, is using this uh, deep linking technique that I was talking about. So effectively, if you can construct a URL that basically has the device identifier in there, like a device name, for example, um, and you build the URL based on our, you know, the automation FX or phone FX server and port details, et cetera, you can effectively jump straight into that control page and control that phone, or alternatively, with one of the other URLs, jump straight into the edit page or the line edit page or the speed dial edit page, et cetera. That's what that deep linking's for. So if you do have some in-house or other uh, help desk system, then it happens to have uh, you know, the device MAC address in there somehow, because whatever data records you might maintain against that, that user or help desk ticket, um, then actually you can just compile a link and go straight into PhoneFX from that help desk system, for example. So again, I'd be curious for anybody that would be interested to do that, but we've designed it for that kind of external integration. So that's the genetic capability that deep linking provides. But what we've actually done is create two specific examples of that in action. Uh, one of them is we've built a little Chrome extension. And the way that works is you go to, there's the, the big long URL there. Um, actually, what I'll do whilst uh, I'm on this page, if I can find it, I think it's on this one. I'm just going to pull that URL out from the slide deck on my other computer here and just post it into chat. So you've got a button there. Uh, oh, excellent, got a question uh, about the reorder button. I'm just going to jump back because that's good timing for that question. Um, so yeah, we deliver the question there um, was, can the buttons be reordered? Now, I might show that a bit better in the demo, but you can see you've got the lines, the speed dials and things like that on this uh, device level page. And what you might notice is there's a little three line uh, kind of icon in front of each of them. Technically, that's a grab handle, and it allows you from a user interface point of view to reorder those buttons. But we haven't actually implemented the code to carry forward that change, right? It, it would deliberately have teasing people, to be honest, to show what's potentially possible, but we haven't wired up that particular component of the modification. There's a couple of things that make it a little bit challenging because unless, you know, you're going to have to modify a button template and if you're modifying a button template, you have to make sure it's an individual template to that user and a few other things like that. So you don't kind of have a bit of a confusing change, um, but we, we can do it. Uh, we've not added it yet, um, but thanks for bringing that up. Again, it's, it's on our to-do list. Um, and the fact you've asked that question um, would indicate that it's obviously something that would be of benefit. So, you know, we'll be looking forward to uh, creating that feature when we get the, the opportunity. Um, but we deliberately have been teasing people by making the GUI drag and drop. But yeah, some point in the future, we'll be glad to tell you when, um, when it's done, uh, we'll make that uh, actually take effect. Because if there's anything I find personally frustrating, it's some of the user interface components of the CCM admin page uh, are quite obtuse to use, uh, counterintuitive and just tricky to say, to say the least, be polite about it. Um, and we, when we built this interface for editing the phone and stuff like that, um, we kind of, from our point of view, I think we figured out a really good solution overall, but you know, still little parts of that to kind of implement uh, to make it everything that we want it to be. Uh, okay, so just jumping back to the external integration piece. <clears throat> so uh, I think I posted it. Yep, so I've posted a link to the Chrome uh, add-on. So just quickly, I'll hopefully be able to demonstrate it, but just to quickly describe what it is. If you look at that screenshot on the kind of top side there, you're looking at the CCM admin page and specifically it's on a particular device configuration. Okay, so it's like you're editing a phone. Okay, now when you're on that page, the little kind of blue unified FX icon is available to you. And you get this little button that 
appears when you click it called launch PFX control. We're going to change the name of that. That's just like an internal name. Um, really should say phone control or phone FX control, just be a bit better. But ultimately, when you click that button, technically using that deep linking approach, it then pops out an instance of phone FX for that phone. And the way that it does it is the URL that you're on there on that particular device page actually has the unique key or good for that phone, which we understand and can use. And that allows us to identify the device that you're editing right now, so that when we pop out that phone FX instance or launch that open, um, it can show you the same uh, page. So that means you don't have to use um, our editing page. Right, you can actually just use as you would normally do CCM admin, but give people the ability to quickly and easily jump to the control aspect to, to tie in with that. Uh, so we think, you know, it's not rocket science, it's still a little kind of bonus thing that, to demonstrate uh, that. I'd be interested on people's feedback if anybody who's maybe been early adopters sort of tried it yet, or anybody subsequently that's going to take the opportunity to, to give it a spin, uh, we'd, we'd like your feedback. Uh, the other external integration is the partnership we've struck up with uh, Stack8. As much as we do what I class as a little bit of provisioning at the device line level, etc., we don't have any ambitions to be a, a full provisioning solution for communication manager. Um, but there's other companies that do do that. Um, and Stack8 is certainly one of the, the ones that we have, uh, like and have been able to work with really well. Uh, so what that means is anybody who is already a Stack8 customer, you just need to update to whatever the latest version is. And what they have done is on the kind of phone edit kind of page, uh, the body that is an old graphic, so probably put the icon or something in there um, in the latest version. But they've got a little phone control button. And when you click that, Using that same deep linking capability, it pops out an uh, instance of phone FX uh, for that phone. So we have had feedback that a number of Stack8 customers have already you know, taken advantage of that capability. So that means if you need more provisioning than you know, we've given you with the phone FX solution, uh, you can go into you know, other device types and other components, like voicemail configurations and stuff like that, which we don't touch. Um, then Stack8 would be uh, our recommendation uh, because it works obviously with that integration to work the two together. In terms of the requirements, uh, technically what I've got listed here is a little bit higher than you really need. Um, but because the automation FX platform is designed to run multiple things, we, we like to kind of overspec it a little bit if you're going to put it down on a machine because there's a good chance you're going to have more than just phone FX on it. You might have notification FX, you could even have migration FX, or you could have obviously phone view on that single machine. So it's just to give you a bit of headroom. Um, but ultimately, uh, you know, reach out to us if you get any kind of queries about the uh, capacity of the box. One thing is, uh, it is 64 bit only. So you can't put it on a 32 bit OS. It's something that we've kind of managed to ditch is 32 bit support at least from the automation FX side of things. PhoneView still supports 32-bit versions of Windows. Um, but you know, over time, uh, there'll come a point where nobody's got a 32-bit operating system anymore. Don't know when that will be, but it's going to happen at some point. So there's no need to, to really worry about supporting 32-bit OSs going forward. Um, one important technical point, at least I think it's important because we've put a lot of work into it, is um, we've it has got full multi-cluster support, including mixed UCM versions. That is not a small thing to do. So if you have used or any other remote control tool that works using CTI, I don't think there's many. I, can, I don't even know which ones do it. There's maybe two others I can think of. Don't my head. Um, that's great that they use CTI and they've kind of copied our implementation for doing that because we were the first to you know, figure out the, that CTI was the right way to control a phone. Uh, but ultimately, um, when we did that, we also went a little bit further because we figured out a technique to work multiple different CTI versions simultaneously. And that, that's no small task, which means from your point of view, you can install phone FX against any variety of clusters, as long as they're version eight and above, obviously, and it will just work. Um, at the fastest possible way that 
the system will allow. You don't have any considerations about, oh, I need to have all the same version of call manager, I need to have two separate servers, one for this, etc. We We take all that pain out of the way. And it, it wasn't a small task to do that. So it's worth um, highlighting. Okay, so in terms of the kind of setup side of it, this is something that we um, improved upon earlier in the year. Uh, so just kind of reiterating some things that maybe some people have seen before, but ultimately we've uh, simplified the setup. So previously there was only like a manual setup. We had to um, specify accounts you'd previously created and hopefully it's correctly set all the permissions up for. Now you can actually do it uh, with an automatic setup uh, approach. So Basically, the red box highlighted, you get set up in manual. Manual is the old way to do it. You have to do all the permissions, user accounts yourself. If you use the setup button, you get this little form down the bottom there, automatic UCM setup. And when you do that, you provide a one-time setup user. So we won't keep a record of that account. We just use it so we can go and create uh, our own accounts, an automation FX user and uh, a, phone, a UFX phone user, so it's two types, two accounts. One's an application user, yep, that's the automation FX user, and the other account, if I remember correctly, is that end user as well. Um, and we set up all the permissions that are relevant uh, for that too. So it has allowed us to get a very high success rate for initial installations of the software. Uh, which is something that's always been tricky with PhoneView because it's quite a complex set of permissions and other settings that are required, but this has made it a lot more successful. There's still a couple of little things that can catch you out, which are on the next slide, which is mostly for screenshots, um, but ultimately uh, this takes a lot of the pain out of the way. If you don't like the way that we create accounts and automatically setting up accounts and permissions, you can always just use the manual approach and just you know have full control over uh, that setup experience. When it comes to the authentication side of it, this is stuff that's really specific to PhoneFX. In order to see the same thing that the user sees, we have to take a screenshot uh, from the phone's web server. So that's a, a prerequisite for that. Now, we do have ways, and we've got some of it in PhoneFX, all of it in PhoneView though, and more coming to PhoneFX. We do have ways to render what's happening on the phone, even without touching the phone screenshot. Again, another unique. Um, but it's better in reality if you can get a screenshot because it look it's the exact same thing the user sees and allows you to do a few more things too. But ultimately, um, you know, it's a very common requirement that you need to have the phone's web server turned on to be able to even use our software or any other robot control tool for that matter. And as part of that, you have to have a valid authentication URL. When we request a screenshot from the phone, the credentials that we send get forwarded to an authentication URL, and typically that's on call manager by default. And sometimes, even when you're requesting to call manager, it doesn't always resolve correctly. It may be the authentication URL used a host name, and you may not have DNS configured properly, and you might not resolve that. So sometimes using an IP address is a simple way to fix that. Uh, if you not sure about your DNS setup is consistent across all your estate for your phones. Um, the other approach, which is actually our preferred approach, is to use automation FX to authenticate the request instead of call manager. And it's actually quite simple. Uh, and this is in the enterprise parameter page uh, on your CCM admin interface. And um, when you're in there, you're about three quarters of the way down and there's um, a set of URLs in there, and there's the authentication URL I'm talking about specifically. There's technically two of them. There's the authentication URL and the secure authentication URL. Only the newer handset models that support HTTPS connectivity use the secure one. The much older phones like 17, 14, 60 uh, kind of generation, they would use the non-secure one. So even though you've got those two fields there, it's just for backwards support on the older phone models. Most of the time, it's a secure one that will get used. However, even just using the secure URL field um, and leaving it alone, that can sometimes have a dependency on ITL files if it's using HTTPS, etc. So it's generally actually better, ironically, to have a non-secure URL so that you're not dependent on uh, those pesky ITL files. Um, so that's one thing. It's actually ironically better to use HTTP inside a secure URL field um, so that you're bypassing that dependency on certificates. Uh, the other part of it is 
If you do use our server for authentication, all you do is change the server and port number. The rest of the URL stays the same. So we just emulate that path basically on our server uh, to respond to it accordingly. And that just means you put, you're just pointing it from your publisher to the automation FX instance on whatever port you've set it up on default is 8181. And when you do that, what that means is when we send the credentials to the phone, the phone effectively sends them back to us. And then because we obviously we created them and we know what they are, we can instantly validate it and tell the phone to authenticate. If we don't recognize the credentials, we actually just forward the request onto call manager as though we didn't exist effectively. So it's just kind of like man in the middle um, to uh, authenticate. But if we can't authenticate, we'll just let the existing server um, call manager not take care of that. So it's non-destructive from, from that perspective. Uh, um, ultimately, that's the simplest way to do it. Uh, what we also do, assuming that you're using the built-in normal authentication in call manager, a prerequisite for that to work is that the phone you're controlling is associated to the user account that's being authenticated. So the user account, for example, that we would auto-generate the UFX phone user. And what we actually do in the background is we dynamically associate it to that phone. So that account that we create will have no phones associated at the beginning. As you start to use that account by controlling certain phones, we will dynamically associate that phone to it. At the moment, what we do is we just keep associating up to a maximum of 100. There can be some negative uh, effects to having too many associations on some people's systems, especially for end user accounts. So that's why we've got that limit there. Um, we might do something where we cycle it, you know, where we can de-associate um, older uh, entries and reassociate new ones. We've not done that yet. You'd have to manually clear them out if you hit that 100 limit right now. But to be honest, you can bypass all that complexity if you just use automation FX to authenticate the request because there's no need for device associations when you do that. Uh, I'll maybe something I'll be emphasizing a little bit more heavily in the future, but uh, you know, we're just trying to kind of transition people uh, over slowly. Anyway, that was quite a lot of detail on the installation side of it. Uh, hopefully that'll be useful if, uh, if you're setting up at some point. Um, a component I just wanted to touch on, this is a kind of universal thing as part of the platform, is the concept of filters. So anybody who's used PhoneView or is familiar with it would probably recognize this kind of panel on the right hand side. So we've taken this kind of summary capability where we take all the kind of key fields for the phone, things like device pool, extension number, um, <clears throat> et cetera, and we summarize it um, automatically and it's also available as a filtering mechanism. So it means that literally one or two mouse clicks and you can get down to quite a useful subset of devices. So that capability was replicated inside the Automation FX platform, so therefore it's available to PhoneFX. But something you can actually do within PhoneFX that you cannot do within PhoneView is actually save those filters because when we built it, we had a fresh approach at it and we realized that we could actually save that data as well. Um, so you can create and as many filters as you want and load them back up again. So you may have a particular filter for a particular office or model of phone in an office that's registered, whatever kind of state you're looking for. And you can just recall that uh, filter anytime you want. So that, again, that's that flexibility for finding devices because you know a lot of our customers generally have thousands and thousands of phones. So we want to make it easy to, to get down to the relevant phones you want to work with. The way that uh, we kind of work between phone view and the automation FX platforms worth mentioning. So I've got this little kind of integration um, overview here. This goes beyond just phone view and phone FX. I've also got notification FX in here. It's a little bit of an architecture diagram effectively. And um, one of the things we did when we put the automation FX platform together and we wanted it to work with phone view is because usually you'd have you know effectively a single or central installation of automation FX against a particular cluster or clusters. Whereas phone view, you may have a central shared instance, that's a lot of people do that, but you may also or instead have distributed copies of phone view, you know, individually on your laptop working with the same phone estate. Now, if we want those two things to work together, it, it's necessary for phone view to find 
your automation FX instance, right? And rather than having to get everybody who's got a copy of phone view, given a URL or a host name or something to manually manage and enter, we came up with a technique that allows it to be auto discovered. And effectively, the automation FX server um, saves a little bit of data onto call manager periodically, uh, every four hours, I think it is. And all that basically says is I'm here and this is the details to connect to me. No authentication information, just you know, URLs, uh, et cetera, IP addresses. And then what you can do when you do a group update and launch it and stuff like that is you can query that cluster, find out if there's an instance of automation FX that's configured against it. And if there's multiple, it can order by timestamp and stuff like that. Basically, it will discover uh, your automation FX instance automatically which means that when you're inside PhoneView and you have an automation FX installation with PhoneView Phone FX enabled on it, it can right click in PhoneView, do control, do edit, and it will just be seamless. So you don't have to manage that configuration. So something, again, put a lot of effort into to try and make that experience as smooth as possible. Uh, I'm sure we've not got 100% right, but uh, if anybody has any issues with it, you know, let us know and we'll always like aim to improve these things. Okay, so that's it in terms of the bulk of the slide deck. Uh, I've probably spent more time on the slides than I originally planned, to be honest, so I'm going to have to keep the demo a little bit short, because uh, I've just got a couple of slides I want to wrap up on. Uh, but let me jump to here. Uh, yep, I need to share that, so let me figure that out. That'd be this one. Here we go. <clears throat> now, I've not really uh, thought this through, to be absolutely honest, when I was doing the demo, uh, preparing for it. So I'm just going to muck about a little bit and see where I go. But uh, let me just take you through the interface. So technically, what you're seeing here is the Automation FX platform. Uh, I, in my instance, I've obviously got lots of things unlocked. Phone FX, there'll be a couple of things you won't get access to. Uh, the migration menu, that's for migration FX. You wouldn't see that notification menu, that's for notification FX. You may or may not see that depending on what license you've got. The API menu, that's beta. Uh, that is the integration side of what I was touching on earlier. Um, I actually covered a bit of that in notification FX webinar a couple of weeks ago. Uh, started to introduce that a little bit more to people. Um, but that's, again, something for the future, aiming to kind of make it a bit more public next year. What you will primarily be working with though is this phones page so if i click on this and i scroll down a little bit i think i've got a filter in place at the moment just get this now here i've got this search field so just take you through how this uh, interface works so at the bottom of this kind of left hand panel so I scroll down here i've got this summary data so we can see here i've got registered uh, phones counted i've got 26 so if i click registered you can see the table on the right hand side is showing me all those entries. Uh, if I want to go to a particular device pool, let's say I do New York. Now notice the number nine, so that means we've got nine devices in the New York device pool, but because I've got registered ticked as well, it's a combination of those two. So if you look on the right hand side, and actually tells us down here, we've got a total of five registered phones in the New York device pool. So again, that same benefit you get from phone view, just a few mouse clicks and you can actually kind of get a little bit of reporting and understanding of uh, the state of your environment. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm going to, on top of the filtering, you can also sub-filter with a simple search. And this is one of those cross-field searches. It's something we're particularly pleased with because it just takes a lot of pain away from finding things. So you don't have to tell it what you're searching. You just type. And because it's searching multiple things simultaneously, it will match pretty much anything. For example, if I type, GLES for Glasgow, you'll notice that it's got all the devices in the Glasgow device pool. Let's say I type in a model number, 7941. You can see I've got 7941 matched there. I could type in a subnet, actually, let's do that. So if I do 10.40, so you can see I've got four phones on the 10.40 uh, part of the subnet. Uh, so hopefully you can appreciate that's quite quick and flexible. A couple of key presses and you've, you've got what you want. Um, 
columns I've got in by default, uh, you might want some additional data, to be honest. Um, so you can click on the columns button here and add in some other ones. It does get a little bit of a squeeze um, if you put too many columns in, to be honest. Uh, so you do need to kind of be a little bit considerate of that uh, interface wise. This table is a little bit older. It's our first implementation. We've got a newer table we're working, what we're working on in the background right now which will be a bit smoother, a bit slicker. Um, not sure when we'll release it, but um, you know it, it's designed to fix a couple of kind of little glitches this table has, mostly from our presentation point of view, not from a data point of view. Uh, so you know you can add in things like clusters. You can even show firmware uh, data, switch data, uh, stuff like that, which is good. Uh, now to actually do things with the device, um, let's let's find one of the phones I was going to work with. So if I do one hundred one three two, I think that's Mohammed's phone. There we are. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do an edit and a control operation, right? Now, at the moment, to initiate a control, I would choose the little tick box there to select a particular phone and click on this control button. And when I do that, it launches the, um, the phone FX interface, right? And you can see the URL there. It's got that phone FX and device name on it. <clears throat> Again, that's that deep linking. You can just copy that URL, bookmark it, and go straight back to this device anytime you want. You don't have to find it from our interface. And with this in place, I'm just going to test it. If I click New Call, we can see it's got dial tone. I'll click it, Cancel, to hang up. So I've got nice control over Mohammed's phone there. And the important thing is we can see the labels and configuration uh, on the phone, etc. I'm actually going to find another phone. See this little one that's got that BLF number on it, 178. Just to prove a point, I'm going to find that as well. So it's 78. So I type that in, click control. This one's, uh, what was that? 7841. So if I jump in and bring them both up, and if I go and bring up dial tone on the left hand phone, you can see the BLF has changed from, I think it was green to red there. Let me just hang up. Yeah, and you can see that's changed. So I got a working BLF in this case, but imagine I had a broken BLF and I had you know, misconfigured it. I could go away and edit the configuration and prove that it was working. So I've kind of done this in reverse, if you know what I mean. A little point of comment for uh, anybody uh, who's familiar with this software, has used it already, is, is it like a spot the difference? Because I'm using the development code, um, was things we are working on are visible in here that you wouldn't necessarily see in the product. And I just want to make a little point here. See these little uh, extra toolbar icons? They're not finalized yet. But what we've started to add is remote audio support uh, into PhoneFX as well. This is something that was brought up quite a while ago. Um, and uh, we don't have audio playback in the browser. We, we, we might come up with a solution to that in the future, but we don't have that as yet. Um, but we do have a way that you can actually send the audio to a Cisco endpoint, you know, as in a physical phone or something. So if you've got, if you logged into PhoneFX or a particular user account which has some associations, they'll be listed there for you. Uh, otherwise, you just search for a phone and you can turn the Coach Whisper feature uh, on and off. So just to just to be clear, that's not available yet. If anybody does want to try it out, give us a shout and we'll we can unlock it for you, have a play with it. Uh, but that's something that is in the roadmap for some point next year. Don't know exactly when we'll have it all. Finalized. It's actually in good shape, but it's just more of a make sure we're, we're comfortable with, with my testing point of view before we, we share it out wider. But just thought I'd point that out. Okay, so I've got two different phones that I can control. You can see that I've been controlling them. You can see the nice live updates as things happen. Uh, let, let's do some editing. So let's go and bring up Mohammed's phone here. And to edit, I just click the device name portion. And just to be clear, Notice the IP address is clickable. When I do that, it just takes me straight to the phone's web page. That's nice and convenient just to get straight to the device data as well. Uh, but let me click on the device name in this case. And when I do this, it's bringing up the edit interface that I was talking about earlier. Now I've kind of turned everything on here, so let me just turn it back off again. So in simple terms, let me just uh, minimize that panel on the left there gives a bit of space. In simple terms, this is the button configuration. 
uh, similar to the device page in CCM Admin, maybe a bit neater potentially. Uh, show more that expands and shows you all the buttons because even for phones that have the support for hundreds of buttons on them, it's not very common that you editing all of them. So that makes the interface a bit a bit neater. Um, you can see we've got some key data again. We've got the IP address. We've even got amalgamated some other data we have, like switchboard data, uh, which is useful. Uh, you can just go straight in and edit. Um, so things like calling search spaces, we just pull down a list of all the CSS dynamically, and you can choose and just start typing and search for them. So if I go in here and I do uh, GL, you can see it's filtering to all the ones with those characters, and then I just hit enter to choose it. So nice and simple that way. Um, so, you know, by design, it should be quite effective uh, to use this interface. And uh, the bit I particularly like that we added to this was the compare component. So if I flick this little switch to turn on the compare copy uh, capability, then you've got two sources to compare against. As I said earlier, a phone or a phone template. So I've got a little phone template here that I've uh, chosen. And you can see that it does the side-by-side -side comparison. So for example, there's no little checkbox there. And because those values are the same, a lot of fields are the same uh, down the bottom, for example. Anything with a checkbox, um, let's say, for example, I want, I'm not going to do this, so I want to mark up the phone configuration, I'm going to show you in a second, but I can click that checkbox there. And if I hit save, it will then modify the button template on that device and copy it from this template, which in this case is just a standard uh, 7941 template. Um, also, this difference button in the top right corner there, when I click that, uh, it shows me just the delta between those two, so it ignores all the tools that are the same, basically. So it kind of keeps the interface a bit more concise uh, for its purpose. Now, that's the device level edit. Um, people might have played with this already, and I've certainly demonstrated it before. Uh, but what we have added, and I did a little while back, maybe not really published it too much, I've been too heavy on talking about it, is we now have the ability to edit the buttons. but just to clarify, there's two, two kind of angles on editing buttons. One of them is configuring the button. You know, the line configuration, speed dial configuration, stuff like that. That's all available now. The other part is the ordering of the buttons, which is not currently available. So it's this sneaky thing that we're teasing you with that if you can get a grab handle and I can move this around in the UI, but when you save it, it, it won't it'll ignore that view order operation. So fingers crossed that's something we can sort out for next year. Uh, but I hope you would agree that once we have that in place, it's going to be a really sweet solution for um, you know, reordering buttons and stuff like that. What we'll probably do, just talking it through actually, is if your button template is an individual template or one that we identify as unique on this phone, then these buttons will be available so you can edit them. And I think what we'll do is if it was, for example, a shared template, like the standard 7941 SCCP one there, um, then these buttons will either disable or disappear, something like that. So it'll be quite obvious if you can or cannot rearrange them. But for now, we're just teasing you by having them in there to show what we're going to do in the future. Right, well, let's show you some of these edits. So for example, if I go to uh, BLF1 and I click on it, you can see that I've got the label is modifiable. Let, let, let's actually do some edits here. I haven't actually tested this on this phone, so I could break something. But let me just try this out. So if I grab this guy and just fit him into the left hand side of it, like so, push him to the right corner, fit him a wee bit. So hopefully you can make that out. But on the right hand side, we can see there's a BLF1 there and a BLF2 there. So it's BLF1 labeled here. Let's be inventive and put one, two, three on it. Uh, actually, why don't we just put the number, given that it's right down below there. I'll put a little space in. So we've changed the label to be a bit more useful to map, uh, represent the number that it's mapped to. We'll click update. And we can see that it's changed that to orange to represent that we've made a change to the button configuration. It's not saved it yet, but it's just recorded that we want to make a change. Now, just make sure I don't break anything here. I don't have any of those copies turned on. Okay, I don't think so, let's turn that off. So hopefully the only edit I've done in this session here is to change that BLF name. 
So let's hit save. So we get a little green toast there just to confirm the save operation was accepted. If we look on the right hand side, see the phone's kind of resetting. Yeah. And then if you look at that button there, BLF 10,004, so it's made that change. So you can see that was very effective, a very quick edit, a very quick validation. I can obviously press that button and I'll try calling it. Now, I think that phone's offline by the white icon anyway, so it's not going to get us anywhere. But you can see how simple that edit was. And that's the same for the other button types, you know, like service URLs and things like that. Um, now, let me show you a line. Uh, may not edit anything, but just to show you that it's there. So I click on the line option and uh, you can see that I've got the display labels, the uh, text, the busy triggers. I've got the calling set spaces and things like that. Now, for anybody who does start using this feature to any kind of level, if there's any fields you want us to add in there, uh, just, just let us know. It's actually technically really easy for us to just add more and more fields, but we didn't really want to overload people by having everything that's in the CCM admin interface in there. We wanted to choose the most frequently uh, accessible uh, entries. Um, but again, if there's something that's important to you, uh, you want to add in there, let us know and we can get that added quite, quite quickly. Um, okay, so that's the uh, edit side of it. You can see the control side of it. Let me show you the external integration aspect of it. Uh, yeah, and we're just hitting the end of time anyway. So I've got CCM admin open. So let me log in here. And what I'm going to do, just to prove a point, I'm going to close these sessions I had open a minute ago. So I've got all I've really got here is the CCM admin interface. So let me go to the device page, go to phone, hit find. Oh yeah, that's something I forgot about. Let's use this. Now, what you might notice here is I've got a client service framework device, so a Java device basically. Uh, you can see it's actually registered. Just going to show off a little bit. I've got phone view running here and if you didn't catch it, uh, when we did the phone view version 7 preview webinar a, a few weeks ago, quite a lot of people did attend that, which is great. Uh, but if you didn't see what we covered there, one of the things that we've added to the next release of phone view, which is to be generally available on January the 23rd, but you can get beta access now if you want, is the embedded cell phone capability. So what we've actually got here is cell phone support has been included. And as part of that cell phone support, not only can you see and control cell phones, you can also register them uh, directly inside phone view, just as though you had a cell phone client on your PC. This one's particularly powerful because you can register multiple simultaneous Java devices on a single computer as well, which is never something I've, uh, I think anybody's done before. Uh, so just showing off, because what I've got here, technically is an instance of phone view registering an instance of uh, Java device, just to prove the point. And we're going to this other one just next to it, the kind of two device there. And yep, you can see some activity logs. So it's just registering and it's coming online. So if I hit find on this, we can now see that JavaFX2 is now online as well. And let's just use this one. Uh, so if I now go into this JavaFX2 device, which is online and registered, I've got my Chrome extension here. We click on it. We get this little launch phone FX control button. And when we click that, it launches an instance of phone FX. But what we've also done with PhoneFX, we've added support for soft phones too in there. So this is technically a Jabber instance. It's using a rendering capability so we can see the calling activity on it. And we can obviously control it in here. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to drive it from phone view in this case. Just uh, And you're going to see it on the right hand side here. So I go into this device, I hit enter to go off hook. And you can see simultaneously it's doing that on the control. Let me dial a number, so that'd be 7501, I think. So you can see the same thing on the right-hand side. We'll go to that device, we answer. Uh, let's go back to the phone here and hang up. You can see it drops a call and it's represented that way. So that could be an end user uh, with their own Jabber instance, active and registered. That can be IP communicator as well. 
and allows us to work with it. Now, the important thing is it's not touching to any web servers because it's using CTI to, to render it. Um, so the two things I was really showing you there, one of them is this Chrome extension, which allows you to go from the device level page straight to controlling the phone and testing the phone. And secondary, the fact that we've also added support for soft phone devices as part of phone FX as well. The soft phone support that's coming um, as part of version seven. Uh, so let me jump back to the slide deck and just wrap up the last few slides. So in conclusion, as we like to do, uh, you can actually get phone FX and notification FX for free. Uh, and it works for up to 3,000 phones. There are a couple of feature constraints on those free versions. So it's great that you can work with them uh, for free up to 3,000 phones, but there's a couple of critical things that uh, we have held back in there to be fair. Uh, so for example, in the free variant, um, you cannot use the settings button. Um, you cannot make any changes. You can see the changes, you can compare devices. Uh, you can see a device, you can compare the device, but you can't save any changes uh, in the free version. And uh, obviously it only goes up to, to 3000 phones. Um, if you do want to get all that functionality, uh, you've got the choice of either buying phone FX itself standalone, and that's the URL for it there. Let me paste those URLs into the chat window, actually, just for convenience. Two seconds. Grab that and stick it in here. <clears throat> so if you've got the phone FX URL, you can um, take a free copy or uh, buy a copy and the price should be part of the shopping cart experience when you go in there. Um, and ultimately, you know, give, give it a spin. In terms of uh, what we're coming up, in the future. Uh, the next uh, webinar is for Wallboard version 4. Uh, so that's the one where we just got the Cisco compatibility badge, which is something we worked hard towards, We're really pleased about that. Uh, the key feature that was added to 4 uh, to allow us to do that was high availability support. So previously, you'd have to manually change the IP address if you get a high availability pair of UCCX if the, one of the nodes failed. Uh, now it's fully automatic and tracks the, the master server uh, all by itself, uh, which meant we had to kind of rewrite quite a lot of code, to be fair. Uh, so we put a lot of effort into testing all that out so we could get through the compatibility as well. So it's just a lot more. Uh, reliable in terms of its connectivity to UCCX because of that effort. Uh, we also have uh, a, a partnership with a company called Quasi, who do a kind of CRM customer experience uh, type things for you know lots of different environments, but typically using things like retail and uh, we've got a kind of customer journey demo of how their software works with our software and allows you to you know fit a few kind of use cases. So it's a nice kind of general. Um, couple of scenarios in there that uh, we've managed to demonstrate on how our two systems can, can work together. Uh, so if you do get a chance, it'd be great to join that session if you've not registered already for it. And feel free to <coughs> uh, watch the recording. If you don't get onto the session, we'll post that as well. Uh, then January, I'll be, as I mentioned, I'll be going to Migration FX. There's a chance we might have that uh, device profile functionality ready by then, even if it's not in the production version, it might be ready at least for beta testing by that stage, I hope. Uh, so if anybody's interested in that, we can cover that in more detail in that session. And then uh, we aim to launch uh, PhoneView version 7 for general availability on the 23rd of January, just before Cisco Live Barcelona, so that ties in quite nicely. Right, I think that's it for today's session. I can see a couple of questions, uh, so let me just quickly review them, but we're generally kind of done, so thanks for everybody's 